This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to our newest episode of Glove Stories with Murph. And it is a real pleasure to uh, welcome in our next guest, the guy who played 16 years in the big leagues and then had a very successful broadcasting career. After that was said and done, he is, uh, well, as a 12-year-old boy, he was my favorite player. I'm not afraid to say that. And uh, he brought a lot of joy to the folks in Philadelphia for many, many years. Please help me welcome Gary, the Sarge Matthews, who joins us today here on Glove Stories with Murph. Sarge, it's so good to see you. Murph, so good to really be here. Obviously, it's been a difficult last year and a half, but uh, baseball being back and seeing the guys play uh, really can't help but to bring uh, a smile on your face. You just almost really, really, you you forget how much it really means to you. Not just baseball, though, but uh you know, all sports. Yeah. No, I, th- I think you've said it uh, perfectly because I think we, what we all realized is just how much we missed, you know, not the winning and the losing, but the being around and being at the ballpark or being watching a football game with your buddies or anything like that. So much of, uh, of our enjoyment, if you're a sports fan, is just uh, kind of being a part of it. And it's good to yeah. be back to being a part of it. Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. Uh, you know, uh, a change of the guards, obviously, with some of the younger players that are having so so much uh, success. Uh, you've had a chance to see that Toronto Blue Jay uh, uh, club. And I got to tell you, man, his dad was a great hitter. Uh, obviously, would hit and expand the zone. But the quickness that uh, uh, Junior shows is yeah. just, and not only that, he can hit the ball out any part of the plate. And he's the type of guy that you go like, hey, who's coming out? Oh, I better wait before I go to the uh, bathroom here. I need yeah. to see guy uh, hit. He uh, is the type of player for me that could play, uh, could play in any era. Right. And that might be the biggest compliment that you can give a player in this era to, to come from a guy like yourself saying, you know what, you could have played – back when I was playing and fit right in. Uh, you're talking about Vlad Guerrero Jr., just so folks, in, in, in case people aren't uh, picking up on that. But yeah, and and there are other guys like that. And, and we'll talk about that. But I want to talk about another young, dynamic player. But we got to go back in the way back machine and back to 1972, 1973, when this young guy was coming up in the San Francisco Giants organization, uh, outfielder with a, a big personality and, and a great bat. And uh, you remember that guy, Sarge, don't you? Gary Matthews, senior? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was a good time, awful cold. Uh, you <laughs> yeah. A lot, a lot of values in that organization because of Willie Mays. Uh, he actually gave all the outfielders uh, gloves, uh, Gary Maddox, uh, uh, Gary Thomason. I mean, you name it, every single spring. Uh, he would uh, give gloves to all of the outfielders. Obviously, uh, Gary Maddox did the best because he duplicated Willie Mays and winning eight straight gold gloves. Uh, a lot of people don't know that and really don't even uh, talk about it a lot. But, you know, I've been really blessed to have come in in that era. Willie McCovey was uh, our locker uh, uh, partner. Yeah. Uh, they actually introduced me to wines, and I mean, starting from the bottom to where uh, we are to this day, I can't help but to remember the uh, the Blue Nun and Matus that I used to have to carry on the bus uh, for him, and also that boom box that was pretty heavy uh, back in the day. But that was kind of like an initiation, if you will. Yeah. You were really proud to do it because guys like that who actually, uh, you know, a Hall of Famer, I mean, you knew he was going uh, uh, to be, uh, for him to take us uh, under his wing uh, uh, to this day, uh, God rest his soul, Willie McCovey was a big, big influence on both 
uh, myself and uh, uh, Gary Maddox there. Yeah. Uh, great times uh, in 73. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's an interesting topic. And we, it's one we've talked about here on Glove Stories before. And that is, you know, young guys coming into the league, veteran guys, especially guys with Willie McCovey's kind of back of his baseball sure. card kind of thing. I, I wonder, you know, so you come in, you get your debut in 72. You played what? I think you played 20 games in 72. And then in 73, you hit the ground running. And obviously you were the uh, National League Rookie of the Year. The old adage is, as a rookie, you came in, you did your job, you didn't talk unless you were spoken to. But I wonder, a guy like yourself, who was playing so well and was such a big part of the Giants that year, did those rules apply to you? Were you able to kind of show your personality right off the bat with those guys? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, again, first of all, you're really happy about being in the uh, major leagues, Gary Maddox was actually there the year before. He actually mm -hmm. took Willie Mays' place, uh, was traded to uh, New York. So that in itself was kind of uh, a change of the guards, uh, if you will. We had a lot of hitters throughout uh, the minor leagues. Matter of fact, just about everywhere you would go, you'd hit 300 and would damage. And I mean, from a ball all the way to uh triple a uh we would play against the high a ball uh to this day uh george foster always asked me he says hey uh sorry child's your knee uh i misjudged the ball and uh he had a line drive off my knee when we played <laughs> you know in spring training but those were the type of caliber of players yeah. that science had in the system in order to make trades and so on, even though they end up being um, uh, bad trades uh, in a lot of instances. But uh, that year, remember now, that was the year Mike Smith uh, actually uh, broke in, uh, Dave Winfield, Ron uh, Say, and Davey Lopes. We had quite a few uh, really nice or, or good rookie of the lead, uh, year, Steve Rogers. You know, another uh, player that had a pretty doggone good uh, uh, career, Bill mm -hmm. Maddock, I think, was also in that group. But, you know, to come out and be the uh, rookie of the year uh, and, uh, and to hit 300 uh, really, really uh, uh, stands out. And I can remember, like, it was yesterday, Murph, when uh, we went into uh, – Philadelphia, and Mike told me, says, hey, man, uh, you, because uh, uh, Mike led all the rookies, obviously, in home runs. I right. forget what he hit that year. But he says, hey, you better be lucky. You're uh, hitting 300. I'd win that rookie of the year. Well, you know what? I wasn't even thinking about it, really, at all. I was just trying to get me uh, uh, some hits and to finish <laughs> uh, trying to hit 300. And then I told him, Besides that, you can't win rookie of the year striking out almost 200 times, but he still became a great player. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt, uh, uh, the best player I've ever had to hit by, behind me. And uh, it really does make a difference. Uh, I, I mean, I can see him in the batting circle and not even see him, you can hear him, you know? and. Uh, the pitcher would get like two balls and no strikes on me. And they, and, and edible, they always look over in that <clears throat> on deck circle. You know, Mike is swinging that like just, I mean, a giant. You could actually hear those weights hit because they would yeah. seem like, what? Clap. And uh, he'd turn around and look at me and I'd go like, hey, buddy, you got nowhere to go. <laughs> I'm red. And Mike would always say, hey, man, don't swing at me on bad pitches. I learned how to walk and on base percentage really because of him. And when I got traded to the Cubs the next year, I led the league uh, in walks and uh, on base percentage, mostly, again, because of Mike and his discipline. I mean, Mike studied it. Great, obviously, a uh, player, but... Uh, 
He's the type of player, obviously, that makes other players uh, better. Right. Uh, talks a lot more now, obviously, than he did when he was playing. Uh, just really never said a word. I mean, <laughs> uh, Andre Dawson never said a word. Uh, Sandberg, all of a sudden now these guys are chatty Cathy. I yeah. mean, it's just unbelievable. But, unlike unlike you, who, who was talking the whole time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listen, you know, I mean, I've had no problem in doing this throughout, you know, my uh, uh, career. Uh, and I think really in the long run, Murph, it does kind of help you because in order to grow, really, you have to be able to take constructive criticism and take it in a way where you're going to really get better or say like, hey, you know, I'll show you. A lot of players today, man, these managers, they go up and they say, hey, man, catch the ball or do this. I think Girardi had a, a little spout with Segura. Well, they they want to come to blows. All they said was catch the ball. Man, you're making uh, whatever millions you are. You can't catch the ball, throw the ball to the base. Hey, you know, and then sometimes managers get, uh, you know, heated up. So, uh, you know, I'm glad my coaching days are over. I really, really enjoyed it. But man alive, <laughs> it's a test daily for yeah, sure. It's different for sure. Uh, before we leave uh, San Francisco, I, I do want to ask you, you mentioned a couple of those teammates. I, a guy you didn't mention, Bobby Bonds was on that team. I, I, I think Dave, is Dave Kingman on, on the team early on? I don't know if he was uh, there at the exact same time as you, but, you know, in, in looking back and seeing, you know, McCovey, you mentioned uh, Gary Maddox uh, as well. So many great players. And, and I would imagine all of you guys kind of, I mean, you think about that outfield with, with yourself and Bonds and Maddox. I mean, Talk about uh, talk about some names, right? Yeah, we had a, a really really great time. Uh, uh, Bobby was kind of like the player that uh, Matt Ox and myself and a lot of our uh, fielders, Jack Clark, the Ripper, also yep. uh, was there. That we patterned ourselves, you know, after uh, Bobby's uh, play. Bobby told me before if he had known that uh, thirty thirty was going to be a big deal. He would have done that every year. This guy stole bases uh, actually standing up. He was our leadoff hitter. He struck out a lot, but he'd drive in 100. He'd score 100, uh, you know, hit you 30 uh, home runs, win a gold glove. And really, as great a player as he was, his son Barry was like twice as good. Can you even imagine that? Uh, and the fact is, I saw Barry play during, you know, his uh, adolescence and coming up. I am not surprised. He did the same thing there he did, you know, in Little League. Cocky, uh, fast runner, and uh, always believed in, uh, in his uh, ability. Uh, what a true athlete. I yeah. Mean, a feared hitter in this time. I think we forget, you know, uh, and maybe people choose to forget just how great of a player he was before, you know, the the whispers began about maybe what 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 he and many 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 other players were doing uh, in terms of the the performance enhancing stuff. But you know, he was a, he was on a Hall of Fame track when he was with Pittsburgh. Oh. Yeah, and and yeah. that was well before any of that stuff. Um, you know, if you love the game of baseball and you got a chance to watch Barry Bonds play, you re you can't help but appreciate what he's what he's able to do, man. Because what he did is hard. You know, what all you guys do is hard. You know, he made it look easy. Right. Uh, th those kind of guys, Murph, uh, when they play, and you're absolutely right, uh, it the game slows down and it's so easy. The ultimate compliment. Uh, I think that I uh, end up witnessing uh, for Barry was when he was walked with the bases loaded and it was two outs and they were up by two runs uh, there with Arizona Showalter. And I was just kind of, kind of saying, man, what is going through his mind? He's probably one of the only managers I think that would have walked him in that situation. And he looked at him and just said, Hey man, uh, I got nothing for you. Uh, and Barry also was intimidating because 
you get ball two on the on the guy and he looks out there at you he starts taking off his uh armor uh you know i can remember ben sheets when i was uh the hitting coach over there in milwaukee dave stewart was the uh hitting was the pitching coach our game plan was not to even throw him you know a strike pitch around him well he was only supposed to play one day first pitch Ben Sheets throws over his head. I'm sitting next to Dave Stewart, and I said, "Hey, man, what, what is, what's, what's going on here?" Before I could actually even get it out, he had put one out there, and when uh, Willie's cold, and then he proceeded to play all the games. Yeah, we lost every single one. <laughs> and I told Dave Stewart, "In your best day, you could never get this kid out." Dave Stewart's nickname was Smoke. Yes. Well, Barry would have smoked him out there. You know, <laughs> well, there's some guys you do not intimidate. And by the way, that series, I think he had like four home runs. Yeah. Uh, and he hit two or three just foul. So I said, thanks a lot, Dave, as we're eating our uh, dinner. And he's sitting there, you know, rocking like he has some kind of a... <laughs> bad neck or whatever <laughs> a little uh, ptsd probably you know it's I mean, uh yeah it's it's crazy to think but uh, he was that good he was that oh, good no doubt about it really yeah. i mean head and shoulders and you can name a lot of great players uh there's no greater hitter that has played uh, the game and when you talk to tony gwen i had the uh, uh, honor of listening to Ted Williams, they actually see the ball hit the bat. Now, let me tell you, I've seen it occasionally. Huh, there you go. 280, 281, you know, 340, 360. Right. Same thing with Barry. Actually seeing Pete Rose did it. Could see the ball hit the bat. Man, you see that all the time. You know the strike zone. You're going to hit 300. I mean, there's just no question about that. For me. Yeah, it's a gift for sure. Uh, you you mentioned uh, Dave Stewart. You mentioned the nickname Smoke. And here's something I don't think I've ever asked you. And this is kind of a side note. But where did Sarge come from? Where did the nickname come from? Was it? Did you come to the big leagues with that uh, nickname in place? Well, no. Uh, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to say this, but uh, in San Francisco, uh, and then Randy Moffitt, I was just with sure. uh, Randy Moffitt, Billy Jean King's actual younger brother. Yep. And my big thing there uh, and throughout the coming up to the minor leagues and my first year was sweet. Okay. And um, uh, even though I was there in uh, San Francisco, you know, sweet because you're actually, well, you know, you know, being able to hit the ball sure. uh, sweet. And to hear Willie McCovey really call me that uh, almost sends uh, chills through you. And he's, uh, again, one of, was, was one of my biggest mentors. But uh, Pete Rose nicknamed me the Sarge there in Philadelphia. And he said at the uh, time when, you know, a future Hall of Famer gives you a nickname, uh, he said it, uh, he sticked, it sticks. Well, he got one part right. We got <laughs> <the> <laughs> stuff. And uh, to this day, and I talked with Pete about two or three days ago, uh, oh. as well, uh, uh, no more bigger competitor than I've ever played with. Uh, than Pete Rose, and you know why he gets hits, but even in the exhibition games, Pete plays the whole game, and he's serious. Yeah. You know, most of us want to get out of there after one at bat, two at the most, and uh, those young kids, mm -mm, they do not get Pete Rose out. Let me just tell you that. No. Great yeah. And, and you know what? So it's a great place to, to jump to because uh, you, you go from San Francisco to Atlanta and, and we'll get back to your Atlanta days. But uh, but then you come 
to Philadelphia and you arrive in Philadelphia. Uh, you're part of this, uh, this 1983 team that obviously gets to the postseason. Uh, you, you were, you were in the postseason in 81 with the Phillies first and foremost. Um, and then two years removed, you get the 83 team. What, were, what was your thought process as they started adding some of those guys into your clubhouse one by one, as you said, future hall of famers start to, to come into the clubhouse and you guys are getting set for 83. There must've been a, a lot of excitement around there, right? Well, it was a lot of uh, excitement and somewhat uh, disappointing uh, there. I remember Joe Morgan, because no matter how you played, he's coming there with some armor, all mm -hmm. those guys, two MVPs. It wasn't his best year that year. And Joe said, you know what? If we, uh, if we can get down to September, I'll make sure that we're in, you know, the World Series. And I'd be doggone uh, end up sweeping the Mets in a uh, five-game uh, series. And, uh, you know, it was on. Uh, a lot of pride. I can see why the Big Red Machine was able to play like the way that uh, they did. Tony Perez was actually yep. on our and uh, during that World, World Series, if you can remember, you know, they benched Pete Rose and uh, Tony Perez was playing first. Yep. Uh, Mike Bennigan was on the, uh, on the mound for the Baltimore uh, Orioles and uh, he was still, you know, in the game. Uh, I remember going up. Uh, to the plate, and Pete says, hey, man, make sure you make, uh, you look fastball, don't be late. And uh, I look fastball anyway, because that's the way we were taught. But I end up uh, hitting the ball out of the ballpark, uh, my only home run in the World Series. And I said, hey, man, thanks, Pete. And uh, it shows you, even when he's not playing the game, uh, Pete was uh, in the game, for in sure. The game. Yeah. Yeah. And that can't be said about uh, everybody. And, uh, you know, that's he just understood the game at, at that level, obviously. And uh, and that was good for you guys. Uh, I don't want to get past the you know, let's go back to the NLCS, because sure. in a lot of ways, you know, that is what has kind of um, put you in to Philadelphia sports lore, the way you played in that NLCS uh, against the Dodgers. Uh, you just were outstanding. You were outstanding in 81 in the postseason too. You guys ended up losing that series, but in 83, yeah. in 83, you came in and just, you know, really played outstanding. I'm not surprised knowing you the way I know you uh, that you rose up in big moments. It, when you were in big moments, did you feel that? Did you say to yourself, yeah, bring it on. This is what I want. I think most athletes Murph, think it's kind of really uh, fun. Uh, you separate the men from the boys when you go to uh, the world series in particularly, there's been so many great players, including Dave Winfield that, get to the postseason and you know something seems uh, to be able to happen mm -hmm. it is a fun time uh you're on stage uh remember the, those games against la i mean we uh they beat us pretty good during yep. the course of the uh the season but uh we really did just rock them and uh, kept it going. They have, they're primarily their same team and Ron Say and Garvey and, you know, Dusty Baker. They had some guys that could really, really play. But to really beat them in that particular instance where the Dodgers had kept the Philadelphia Phillies from going to the World Series, not once, but twice. Right. So be able to uh, beat them there and also... Uh, one of my nemesis, Tom Lasorda, and to see him drop his head, I'm telling you, it just uh, brings just joy uh, to my heart. Because I tell you, I can't tell you, growing up in the Giants organization, right. how many this guy would uh, win against me, starting yeah. in a ball, even in AAA. So to come back and to burn uh, Tommy like that, whew. I Nothing gotta, better. That was just uh, that was just great. What yeah. a great uh, what a great uh, feeling that uh, uh, series for sure. 
Well, like I said, you played terrific, but one of the lasting me memories that so many folks have is that three-run home run you hit, uh, I think it was in the first inning, if I'm not mistaken, um, against the Dodgers. That was game if, was that game five? It was game five of that series. It was either it was yeah, it was it was one that put the ice on the yes. game. Yes. Yeah. The but the, uh, but the 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 clip that uh, you know, and I watched it again today because uh, I was getting ready to to talk to you. But it, it, you you hit the baseball, and if people have not seen this clip, well, we're going to put it up uh, during the podcast here. But if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. But if you if you don't remember it, go back and look at it because you hit the baseball, and within I, I don't know a a third of a second, the bat is out of your hands in in vintage flip fashion, uh, albeit down low, but. And you turned to the catcher. I guess it was was it Yeager at that at that point. Steve yeah. Yeager. Steve yeah. Yeager. And yeah. you you said something to him. <laughs> I'm curious as to maybe what that was. Um, I actually I think on the backswing he was almost pretending like I had, I guess uh, hit him and uh, okay. I, something like uh, you know I said hey you you okay or. I mentioned that, uh, you know, take that. It was some kind of something really smart because again, th th those Dodgers and those little pearly white uniforms that they always thought they could really do uh, no, no, no wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and Davey Lopes and those guys on the team. I've been hitting those Dodgers though all my life. So <laughs> it's nothing new. I'm lifetime against the Dodgers. 300 with Don Sutton and all of them. But in that instance where they had beat us all year, I think we only won one game uh, that year uh, in 83 uh, to come back and to win and then tell Dusty, uh, even before we started that I would be the uh, MVP, we went back and forth. That's on uh, record if you ever ask him. He'll <laughs> let me uh, know that. Uh, but you know, again, it's okay to be cocky. It's yeah. okay to be, I mean, like when uh, I would see uh, Iverson uh, uh, play, Charles Barkley, what? I mean, these guys were going at it and uh, again, make other players better. And you, you got to be able to be able to do that if you're going to win. Yeah, Iverson uh, felt short, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't his fault. No. I, 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 can, I can guarantee you that. So and those kind of guys you follow, you know, from almost when they started over there in Georgetown. I mean, just uh, clutch shooters want the ball in those kind of, uh, you know, situations. Uh, it's just a good feeling. I mean, when you dream, you always go like, hey, uh, in the World Series, bases loaded. You know, in my dream, I always like it to be two outs, three and two. That's what I'm talking about. And then see where, where we go uh, from there. I'm yeah. going to be successful all the time. But in the dream, hey, it's, a, you know, game winning knock. Uh, Absolutely. It, for sure. So, uh, you know, it's all about a dream. But dreams coming true, man alive. I've, uh, I've had a good time. Yeah, you certainly have, which is and and you've given so many other people uh, that uh, enjoyment as well, which is which is the best part about being an athlete. I would imagine I'm not one, but the best part about being a professional athlete is that ability to uh, give back this joy that you have playing the game and give it to so many people who are kind of living vicariously through you. Um, and that's what that's what the definition of a fan is. You know, we're here to watch you play, but when you the way you played and the way you enjoyed yourself and the way you showed the emotion, you couldn't help. And again, I, when I was 12 years old, you were my favorite player because of the way you played. And I, I just, I guess I wish there was more of that. It's actually coming back a little bit in baseball, but, but I wish there was more of it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I do. I mean, I think really uh, you look at a guy like uh, Tatis, I mm -hmm. mean, what a, what a backflip. I think that, you know, it is, it's a lot of showmanship uh, in it. Uh, but I looking at this kid, he gives the effort. Uh, the fans there in Philly, blue collar, 
uh, they know you can't fool them. Right. Uh, they know. I mean, one of the reasons L.A. is so candid on the air because he knows, you know, when he goes out or whatever, these guys he's aren't afraid mm -hmm. to come up and uh, say anything to you, uh, and particularly uh, broadcasters there. You know, for sure, they, they take no uh, mess. But again, they know the effort. They know if you uh, 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 can be counted on. And, you know, I got booed for, for a, a pretty long time. Not a long time, but just for a while because, you know, I was taken over for one of my good friends there yep. in uh, uh, Greg Lozinski. Yep. I wasn't traded for him, but I was playing left field. So they were acting like, you know, it was uh, me out there. And they mm -hmm. loved Greg. And yep. Greg had uh, really good years and so on there. But again, when you when you look at it, you know, Greg was a good hitter, gave some uh, 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 great efforts, and uh, that was their all-star uh, uh, player. You have nothing bad uh, to say about him. It's just a tradition as well when you go to the Phillies uh, hey, you go there and, you know, you got to make and do some business. I mean, it would have been great to have played there early on in my uh, uh, career and uh, used to have that, you know, same uh, like they did in the Black uh, uh, Negro Leagues that, hey, don't look for me to make the last out. I don't care if it's two to one, the three zero or hundred to one. That's your app. That's the effort. Right. That Mentality, you know that uh, you're, uh, you're 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 thinking, and I think you got to have it, and you got to be able to, you know, intimidate. You know, somebody's going to be intimidating there, sixty feet six inches, and I can tell you one thing: it ain't going to be me. That's for sure. So you can get me out, you know. And uh, the one thing I really dislike, and 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 you, I've said that before, is. Um, those balls up up near your head. You know, I know we had a little funny thing going on, but man, it is a no-no because you can hit somebody, ruin their careers. Yeah. And look at a lot of the hitters that have been hit. You know, I mean, it's almost like they're on a, a horse. As soon as it gets up there, they're going away from the ball because they remember how that is. You can be intimidated just throwing the ball, you know, down inside. But if it's up there, you you, you got to go out there and uh, get some questions answered. And if you know they say it got away, that'd be the right answer. Anything <laughs> that Houston, we got a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, is it fair to say? Can you honestly say that as a hitter, you never stood in that batter's box, looked out at the mound, and were intimidated by anybody that? Because I mean, you you played in an era where some pretty intimidating yeah. guys. I, I, I will say this, that uh, I wasn't intimidated, but when I went to uh, Houston uh, to play, I thought a good day against J.R. Richard or Nolan Ryan was maybe a couple of punch out, a couple of walks, okay? Uh, the guy like Nepper that's going to be throwing the left-hander, that's the time that we're getting ready to eat some porterhouse. There you go. <laughs> uh, I asked my friend, uh, Bob Horner, I saw him re recently. He used to kill J.R. Richard. And I said, hey, man, I, I need to ask you this. How, how the hell did you hit him that, uh, like that? He said he looks slider every pitch. I was like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> the book on me is high, tight, low in the way. I like going up there. Looking for no slider. <laughs> <laughs> Bring you the heat. Oh, yeah. but he would wear them out, hit the ball out of the ballpark. Uh, and I thought Bob Horner back in the day was one of the best young hitters coming off the campus of uh, ASU. But uh, I will say on those two pitchers, you know, it's like you were in there, but, you know, you're going like, okay. You know, and I've seen Nolan Ryan hit guys in front of me, Barry Bonnell. The, he hit him so hard and just stuck in the side, and the ball dropped down. And I was looking at him, and I said, hey, man. And I didn't know he was that strong. So now I can say I might have been able to second guess. Uh, and then running out there on that mound, he used right. to uh, 
wrestle those bulls. But man, we would have had a little problem if uh, he had hit me like that. But at least he hit him down in the ribs. But uh, Barry had to leave the game too. Uh, by the way, he couldn't breathe for. I him. bet. <laughs> yeah. so, man. And that's the good place of getting hit. Actually, you, you want it oh. on the backside if you can get it. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. you know it's funny. We've been doing this for a couple months now, and and so many guys have have brought up Nolan Ryan in telling stories because there's so many great stories about Ryan and and just his demeanor out there. And you know, Larry tells a great Nolan Ryan story. I think we had a couple other guys uh, do the same. But uh, it, it's funny. I I want to ask you about a story that when we were working together um, on the television broadcast that you told a couple of times, and I'm not going to remember every detail, but I know you will. Um, there was a time where you were, you had, I believe it was Ozzie Smith in your sights to break up a double play and you go into a slide and, and yeah, do you know what story I'm talking about? Yeah. Cause we, we would go in and Ozzie has taken more hits uh, from uh, hitters until it's not even funny. But uh, he was actually, I think, the only shortstop I wasn't able to get because of the fact he would jump so high. So I had him really in my sights. I went in and I slid and I rolled. And then when I turned around, he asked me, you know, was I all right? You know, was <laughs> I okay? Uh, and turned, uh, the I love double. that. He's so athletic. One of the reasons, or the reason why he's in, you know, the Hall of Fame is because yeah. of the way of his uh, fielding. And his hands were so soft. I mean, he'd throw the ball, you know, over to uh, first base. I mean, he used to really rob uh, Jeff Burroughs. Oh, man, a lot. Because Jeff was slow anyway. So, I mean, he'd bare hand balls. And, oh, it was just really a nightmare. You made an effort not to hit the ball anywhere in that uh, area. Um, just a great, great uh, fielder. And that goes to show you, you don't always have to hit in order to make players better on your team. He was one of those guys, uh, for me, that was able to do that. Yeah. And, and later in his career, I mean, he turned himself into a pretty good hitter as well. But but yes, for sure, uh, the wizard was known for for the glove. I, I just love that that vision of you coming barreling into second, thinking you're going to take him out. And next thing you know, he's like dancing away from me and say, hey, I hope you're OK. <laughs> oh, yeah. You see, this was a way that we would retaliate if you were getting hit. Yeah. Because up in that second baseman or shortstop, you know, Larry would always say, I can hear him right now. Uh, I'm on first base. They hit me or did whatever. He'd say, hey, man, get it to me quick. Get it to me quick. Meaning that, hey, I want to get it and get out of here. Yeah. Because they knew. But Bill Madlock uh, would go in and just up in uh, the shortstop or the, uh, the second baseman. And then back then, you were able to, especially runners on first and third, Hey, man, that's an easy run, breaking up, you know, a double yeah. play uh, for your team and so on. And the reputation really will precede you because they know, hey, they got to get it. A lot of times it's a bad throw. They know one thing, they're going to get their body uh, really out of the way. Uh, but, uh, and that reminds me, I mean, you said earlier, Murph, that you really weren't an athlete. I've seen you play golf. <laughs> You're a pretty good uh, uh, athlete and so on. I mean, don't get that twisted. Some of those golfers out there won't four days. Yeah. Well, just, let's put it this way. I wasn't a professional athlete. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, weekend warrior. I, I'll, I'll give myself that. That's about as, as high as I'll go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Like that uh, uh, Sydney Webster. She can't get the ball off the ground and think that she <laughs> go out and play golf or brothers <laughs> don't even bother uh, to go out there, you know, and play, but uh, been there, done that, uh, but I don't do it anymore. I can That's right. That's sure. right. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Um, let me ask you a couple more, a couple more things I want to touch on before sure. I let you go, but this is, this is so much fun. So you leave Philadelphia, uh, yeah. Dallas green leaves, Philadelphia goes to Chicago, becomes the general manager out there. And he has a, 
baseball club that hasn't won anything in in forever and and a team that was not very good and he has this vision to quickly remake it in 1984 you were a huge part of that uh you get traded over there uh with was it bobby dernier that went over there with you uh and you yeah 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 and, yeah. and you have a monster season. Tell me about playing in Chicago and, and getting to the postseason in Chicago, which is something that teams hadn't been doing for decades. Yeah, that was really bittersweet. Uh, that particular year, uh, uh, in 84, Bobby and I were traded late. And Bobby actually was headed to the minor leagues uh, before the trade was actually uh, uh, made. Dallas was notorious for saying, hey, throw that guy, you know, in the deal. And uh, they had no plans, really, for Bobby. Bobby, again, was an excellent uh, fielder, was our leadoff hitter uh, that uh, particular time. And uh, when Dallas traded for me over there, I asked them, I said, hey, man, uh, really, what took you so uh, what took you so long to get this done? And Dallas and I were really, really good friends. Again, the type of uh, manager he was that he put the onuses right there on the player. Um, uh, being traded over there to those Cubs, I got to tell you, it was not good because that's a team when you were in a slump, you know you were going to Chicago, you're going to be able to get yourself a few hits, some home runs kind of get yourself back. So I didn't relish the idea of being with a team that really didn't have, you know, I mean, great pitching, you know, at the time. So he actually put that club together that particular year uh, like Maestro. I yeah. mean, that being Sutcliffe and uh, Eckersley, uh, Steve Trout was there on that team, uh, Lee Smith, Hall of Famer uh, uh, now, I'm really glad to say uh, the type of reliever that when uh, he comes in, game's over. And uh, that's the type of uh, closer you really like to have. Sandbird having an extremely, you know, uh, good year. And when I went there that year, uh, they were actually in spring training. Uh, they were playing like the bad news bears. Couldn't catch and actually couldn't uh, hit it. And I think we played, Bobby and I, three or four games or so before the season was uh, starting. And I came in, I says, hey, man, we can win this thing. And uh, guys were saying, man, who is this kooky guy coming here? <laughs> yeah, has he seen us play, you know, at all? But um, it's something about, you know, going and, and that year and, uh, I remember this at the end, we end up getting uh, um, uh, Davey Lopes on uh, our team after acquiring all these pitchers. And he was sitting there to me and he says, you know, uh, he says, you had a really great year. Uh, he says, I don't know how you, uh, how, he says, I don't know how you would do it. He says, these guys don't think you can win unless you're hitting. He says, that's uh, really too much pressure. He said, I haven't seen anything like that. Well, Davey's coming from the Dodgers, I, you know, yeah. Smith on the team. He's had, you know, I mean, guys being able to help. But these guys, I mean, I had played with them. Keith Moreland, uh, Leon Durham ended up having a hell of a year. Larry Ball, who was always Chatty Cathy, uh, <laughs> well, Ron Say, he led our team with RBIs 97. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. And then we had six other guys or five other guys that drove in over uh, 80 runs. You know, a lot of walks. We knew how to get the guy over and to get them in. Yeah. And uh, when I got there, Dallas says, hey, man, uh, I need you to get these guys going. I said, okay, it was a fun summer. You know, we go to the happy hour where most teams will go out at night. That was an advantage. Right. But putting those putting those victories up early and especially late in the season put a lot of pressure on teams that we got to win because they had uh, uh, won. And, uh, you know, again, it was just a fun, fun time. Not being able to close it uh, after being two games up. 
uh, losing three. Again, a little bittersweet, but right. uh, one of the most uh, fun teams uh, I've had the honor to play with. Yeah, and, and I think it's fair to say that Dallas, who knew you from Philadelphia, obviously, knew that he needed somebody that, much like Pete Rose when he came over to the Phillies, you know, he needed a guy in that clubhouse that could turn around everybody else and be like, we can do this thing. And and you certainly yeah. were, were one of those guys, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and with Pete, see, the players, again, would police themselves because yeah. if you left Pete Rose uh, on third base, he would tell you, hey, man, you know, uh, I get paid to score runs. You can't get me in over there. Uh, we'll find somebody else. <laughs> and he meant that. He didn't care uh, really who it was. Yeah. But Pete wanted to win, you know, as, 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 as probably more, you know, than uh, anyone. But he would set the stage for that. I mean, he would scream out to players or the pitcher out there and tell them, hey, we're going to get you. And uh, he said, yeah, Pete, he said it. And I mean screaming out there. You could not intimidate uh, uh, Pete Rose. And uh, again, he, uh, you know, one of the best guys I've, like, I, I played with, without a doubt, uh, intensity on a nightly uh, uh, basis. And uh, he's one of those guys. <laughs> Don't look for him to make. Uh, that last out in a ninth inning game, you got something else uh, yep. coming. Yep. When you see a guy like that playing so hard, you can't help, you know, but to play uh, like that. But we learned that when the Giants with Mays. I mean, it was just I mean, the, the, the same way. You know, uh, your career goes by quick. That's why you got to play as hard as you can. So you have no uh, uh, regrets. I've been an honor. It's been an honor for me. And then having uh, my son Junior play. Right. Oh, man, a lot. The uh, only thing he can talk about is that catch that he made. <laughs> you know, I catch. <laughs> one, yeah, Gary Maddox called me and he says, hey, man, text me his number. I want to ask what he was thinking when he was in the uh, air to be able to catch that ball. But uh, uh, that was a hell of an athletic move that uh, he yeah. did, you know, that time. And if you go back and look at the clip, Craig Biggio's son was uh, in there uh, dug out as a bad boy, and he was telling his dad, Dad, did you see that? And now... <laughs> Biggio's son is there yeah. with the Toronto Blue Jays yeah. and doing his thing. I mean, how, uh, 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 how ironic uh, that is. But uh, the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree with a lot of these uh, athletes. A no. lot of the siblings yeah. are, are even better there. Yeah, and people should know. I've been around you and, and Junior uh, at the same time, and uh, you wear him out telling him that you were a better hitter than he was. Oh, you wear man. him out. <laughs> I'd like to say, yeah, I, did, I, I, I got all the hits. He's got all the money. So it still works out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you could sell him a couple of your hits, you know? <laughs> Um, uh, hey, before I let you go, last thing, uh, because I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up um, on our Phillies podcast, because part of uh, the the memory and the lure of Gary Matthews in Philadelphia extends after your career. And, you know, you started your broadcasting career in Toronto, but then the Phillies bring you to Philadelphia um, to be a part of their television broadcast. And I really think that uh, if people didn't know you know, who you were before you got to the broadcast booth. They certainly found out who you were while you were there. And you were so well-received and well-loved while you were doing the, the TV stuff. Uh, what do you, what do you remember most about that time, uh, you know, working with Harry and then working with Tom and, and uh, you know, just being there and being a part of it? Well, I mean, obviously um, working with Tom uh, uh, Tom uh, uh, Cheeks working with Harry was really, I mean, just the 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 best. But I remember early on, um, you know, one of my favorite restaurants there is Nick's Roast Beef, and these guys talk a lot of sports all the time. So 
Uh, after like the uh, second or the third year, um, one of the guys uh, in the bar says, hey, Sarge, let me tell you, man, that first year was kind of a little tough. Didn't know if you uh, didn't know you were going to make it or not. But uh, by the way, uh, I got your sandwich here uh, uh, today. Uh, but it, it wasn't, hey, man, you, you, well, you're in the business. Uh, it's one you have to really be able to do your uh, homework. Uh, a lot of instances for the athletes, you got to really swallow your pride. And there's some, you know, tough questions to ask. Yep. But it was a blessing to be able to uh, broadcast with Utley and, you know, uh, J-Row and, you know, those guys, because they said a lot of stuff and they backed it up. Yeah. And easy. I mean, most of those guys, you know, I would say could have played on uh, a lot of the teams that I played for just because uh, of their uh, heart. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, uh, as crazy as uh, Victorino was, man, did he get some big hits yeah. in the World Series? I mean, this is how you judge and ran down a lot of mistakes out there. Uh, you know, uh, it was just a fun club to be able uh, uh, to see. But the one interview I did, uh, which- uh, I know where you're going. Was, uh, it was against with Nolan Ryan and um, Harry was doing his work and so on. And they were like, man, I don't know if uh, we'll be able to get him and so on. Man, I'm in the fraternity. I knew I could get him. So yeah, he came out there and uh, uh, sure enough, we did it. I got back up in the booth. Um, Harry was doing his lineups like he always does. And uh, he had his head down, never looked up and he said, Sarge, one hell of an interview. Never even looked at me, never looked up at all. And uh, it was just an honor uh, to be able to, to, to work with him. Uh, you could tease him, you know, a lot. Uh, uh, I tell him about going to lunch over at the Rue and, you know, how these young ladies had on these nice sun uh, dresses. <laughs> oh, he turned deep red. So you can't, you can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> the air, but I, it just reminds me because Whitey, would say some of it, oh, yeah. you know, and it's in particularly, you know, in getting food sent up there, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the booth. But uh, that was really a, a fun, fun time uh, in, in doing that. Met so many, you know, uh, people uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really, really uh, was a, a, a part of it. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it was, it was fun. It, yeah. it can be uh, intimidating now. Just not get it twisted when that light comes on sometimes. <laughs> oh, but come on. That, that kind of club though, it makes it so easy. Like you're just kind of sitting back in your living room and just, you know, talking about the, uh, the baseball. Again, it takes you time, uh, uh, to learn some of the things to do, uh, early on, uh, that's why I always tell the kids, man, one of the things I did, you know, regret is not really pursuing and going on uh, to school because, again, I was in the major leagues, you know, 20 and 21 to be able to stay. So I've been blessed. I've had a good one. I mean, right now, sort of the only thing I'm worried about is a five foot putt right to left or are the fish biting <laughs> and that as much as I possibly can. Life is good. Sarge, uh, you know what? We're blessed to, to have been uh, able to share a couple of years with you. It's certainly how I feel uh, in the broadcast booth, but the, the city of Philadelphia is better for it that uh, you were a, a ball player here in this city and then uh, together with us again on television. Um, you know, we see a lot that you're, you're around, which is awesome, but uh, so much fun to yeah. talk to you. I knew it would be. Yeah, it, I mean, I like it. I mean, and, and going to the different suites and so on and meeting people, uh, we're talking about almost uh, every subject. Philly fans are just so, so, I mean, passionate, you know, and, uh, and, and I always say about the Cub fans, well, 
heck, up until lately, you know, it's hard to really not like uh, a teddy bear. But over there, it was like, hey, let's go to the game and have, you know, some drinks. It's a little different in Philly. They expect <laughs> you to win. And yeah. really, all their sports, yeah, they don't mind you trying and this and that. But in the end, you know, they want to do some screaming and yelling because they want, you know, a world championship, whether it's right. hockey, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever. And uh, when you do well, though, I'll tell you that, Murph, in this city, you know, all you got to do is just really leave a good tip and uh, everything else is just taken care of. So, again, <laughs> they're pretty passionate about it. Which is why I love going out to eat with you. It's, it's terrific. <laughs> I don't have to pull out my wallet. It's great. Sarge, uh, thank you so much. It, it's, it's a blast. We could probably do this for another hour and a half, but I, I, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your stories. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again real soon over at the ballpark. All right. Yeah, no question. I, I, I really, I really miss going out on the tour, the different ballparks, the different courses we'd be able to get out there. Uh, yeah. uh, play uh but uh you know fun times uh, great uh, memories and uh let's really keep it going happy belated father's day to you and well. to you and to you as well gary matthews our guest here today on glove stories with murph brought to you by the parks casino sportsbook app we appreciate you being with us we've got more coming up right after this glove stories with murph is presented by parks casino sportsbook app New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph. And at this time, we welcome in the manager of the 2008 Philadelphia Phillies, the World Series champion manager, Charlie Manuel, who will help us relive one of those games from uh, back in 2008. Charlie, good to see you. We are talking about July 26th, 2008. Now, let me set the scene. The team had just gotten back to Philadelphia after a six-game road trip to Florida and New York. So you were playing in the NL East, and you were two and four on that road trip. You had fallen into second place in the NL East. The team lost Friday night, the, the pr night prior to this game, against Atlanta at home. So things aren't going well for your team at the moment. You had lost six of the last seven games. What do you remember about, uh, you know, because there were a couple times that season where the team wasn't playing well. What do you remember about uh, the clubhouse and, and what you were saying to the guys as you try to get it back, uh, you know, and kind of right the ship? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I remember that well. Uh, I remember that uh, there's, there was definitely some urgent there for us to pick things up, you know, like yeah. to get back on the right track that we, that, that we were starting to lose games. And, you know, like, and, uh, and we definitely, uh, of course, the, the Braves are one of our big competitors and, and we're chasing it or, or in the race with them. And we need to win some games. And, and I remember that. And going home was good for us. I yeah. definitely think we went off the road to go get home. I think that was good for us, and uh, it was time for us to step up, you know, like and start playing better baseball and things like that, which we were very capable of doing. And uh, we actually talking about it. We didn't, we didn't never talk very much about it, uh, Greg, because our team they knew every day we we like coming to the ballpark and we looked forward to playing every day. We never took look for yesterday and or tomorrow and things like that. We play, we're playing on in that moment. And uh, we always kept that kind of attitude, and we were very lucky. With, and the people that we had bought into that, and uh, and we were kind of built for that too, with the uh, with the team the teams that we put on the field because of the, we were competitive, and that's kind of how we looked, looked at it. And I think looking back now down the road, that definitely paid off for us. I mean, yeah. again, having an act like that, but at the same time too, we come in and. Uh, 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 I think a, at that time, the Braves were playing pretty good, and we had to. Uh, Hampton was pitching for him. He was having a good year. He's a competitor. Uh, he's a control pitcher. Mixes his pitches up, and you know, like, and he didn't give up. You know, like he, he was pretty tough, and you know, like, and, uh, you knew you were in for a dog fight when he's pitching. Yeah. So you know, and, uh, and that's another thing I do remember about it. 
Yeah, that's I, I remember Mike Hampton very well, and he kind of was a thorn in the side. For, well, for most teams, really, but uh, but certainly for the Phillies. But the good news for you guys is that you had your ace on the hill, Cole Hamels, um, who uh, you know was in the middle of having a terrific season. So you had to feel pretty good. Yeah, we've lost six to seven, but we've got Cole going out there. But that's not exactly the way this one played out. So let's get into it. The Phillies would get on the board first in the bottom of the second. Ryan Howard walked. Burrell doubled. Worth would ground out, and they would intentionally walk Eric Bruntlett to get to Chris Coast, and Coasty would single to uh, score the run. It made it uh, one to nothing. Your thoughts on uh, on Coasty? Just because he was such a great story in 2008 for you guys when he got called up, but uh, you know, an even better guy to be around, and he he had some big yeah. moments for you guys. Yeah, you know, uh, I was managing the Indians when uh, Coast was invited to our camp. Yeah. And uh, we were playing an exhibition game one day, and I run out of players. <laughs> and I put Coast in left field, and he never played left field in his life. You know, like you know, like he was a he, he was a catcher, third baseman, first baseman, and uh, I put him in left field. And he and he got some hits that day. I remember when he got some hits that he day, hit. and I started and I started playing him some more. You know, like and I liked him. And then when we picked him up, I mean, I had I had I didn't say nothing about. I never had nothing to say about when we picked him up because, you know, we picked him up, you know, like basically to, uh, for someone who secure, uh, give us security at our uh, AAA uh, yeah. team for, you know, like for catching. And uh, he could have been a second or third catcher for us. That's how we looked at him. And uh, then when we got a chance, I, I definitely asked uh, Pat Gillick and Ruben, you know, like to bring him to big leagues. And, and the reason I did, because he could hit, you know, like he could, he could hit. And and he could he was capable of getting a big hit for you. He's capable of going in and playing, you know, like a, a, like a utility player or a, a part time player and things like that. And I didn't mind Coast hitting in this situation right here at all. Matter yeah. of fact, because uh, you know, like he could come through, with, you know, like and he got some big hits for us. His career proves that. And so no really, like when I look at that, you know, a, a Coasty, I always had faith in Coast. Yeah. And a side note, uh, we, cause we had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago and, and talked to him and he's following in your footsteps. Now he's, he's managing a couple of different teams at this point. And uh, you know, and, uh, and he said, you know, he took a lot of what he learned from you about how you handled your players and that's yeah. the way that he approaches his clubhouse as well. So great story. All right. So we've got Cole Hamels on the Hill. The, the team is up three, nothing. Things are looking good. You're going to break out of this uh, rut that you're in. But uh, that's not how it works because that's baseball. In the fourth inning, the Braves, they find their bats. A leadoff walk to Escobar, then a single by Mark Teixeira. Another walk to Brian McCann, and the bases are loaded. Omar Infante doubles to make it 3-2. to two. Jeff Francoeur hits a sack fly. The game is tied up at 3. But it's not over. Martin Prado, safe on an error by Chase Utley, something you didn't see very often. Then a single by Mark Katze. An error by Hamels allows Mike Hampton, the pitcher, to be safe at first. A single by Craig Blanco made the score 6-3 to three at that point. Then with two on, Mark Teixeira, it's a three-run home run. And just like that, you guys are down 9-3. Cole allows nine right. runs in the inning. You lifted him at the very end of that inning. But uh, he, he just it, – it, it's one of those days. He kind of just uh, – he just lost it. Yeah, he, he just – he kind of lost it. And, you know, like in the uh, – it was – I can remember the game well because anytime you take Cole Hamels or one of our big uh, uh, starting pitchers out of the game, you know, like it uh, always, I was concerned about it. But at the same time, too, it was time for him to come out of the game. And and at that time, you know, we'd gotten fallen behind. But you know, something Murph, we did not quit. When and you know, like, and we just uh, we would we were a team that would keep coming right at you. It didn't yeah. matter what the score was. I learned that a long time ago. And I think if you want to know, I think that I play a part in embedding that in the teams that I manage because uh, I, I, in Cleveland sometime, I, I, I'd pull my guys too early at times, yeah. you know, like we, we could be down with seven or eight runs and nine, all of a sudden you look up and, and we might lose the game 14 to 13 or something. And I wish that I kept a guy back or something. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I, I learned that from experience. We had that type of team. And we were always up and we were and we and we we really worked on playing out 27 outs in the game. And basically, uh, uh, when you do that, good things happen for you. And we just kept chipping away. And, you know, like, and, and that was one of those games. And, and it was, that was one of those games, too, where there was a lot of energy in the ballpark and, and, and there was a lot of flow and there was no quit. 
in either team, I thought. And yeah. uh, that's where Dobbs played the big game. Uh, Dobbs played the role, of course. He, yeah. I mean, he, he, he was the guy that got the big hit. He was. So let's get there because you, now you're trailing nine to three, but your offense, to your point, uh, never gives up. And in the uh, fifth, uh, Jimmy Rollins leads off with a single, followed by a single by Victorino and a single by Chase Sutley. So the bases are loaded for Ryan Howard. He would single, and that scored two. It made it nine to five. Yeah. And you think to yourself, okay, nine five, that's manageable, right? Well, here comes Pat Barlow. He would fly out, but it, uh, but it, it he it was a sack fly, makes it nine six. Right. Jason Worth singles. Bruntlett flies out. Here comes Chris Coast again. He makes it 9-7 with a base hit. And then Greg Snob steps up, two guys on, pinch hitting, and he hits a three-run home run. Dobber was so good uh, off the uh, bench for you guys. When you go back and look at in, in the history of the Phillies organization, right. uh, guys that had huge seasons off the bench, you think of Del Unser, you think of Greg Gross, right. and you think of Greg Dobbs because he did for right. you guys in 08. Right. Let me tell you something. Uh Pat Gillick picked Greg Dobbs up off, I think, off waivers, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And he was what he was a fifty thousand dollar buyer or, or a twenty five thousand dollar, you know, like one of those. And uh, when he came into spring training and I saw him hit, I knew he could hit. You know, like I, I like the style of hitting. I like talking to him and things like that. And uh, he was definitely, I think, the role that he played on our team for for what three or four years or something like that. He definitely was made our bench, you know, like strong. Yeah. And then of course, uh, uh, what we did was, you know, like uh, Pat Gillick always, we always added on in the back part of each season was in the big leagues, probably, you know, like to get stronger off the bench. And that, and there again, I'll give Pat Gillick some credit for these guys, but now Dobbs was definitely, he gets credit for Dobber because Dobber, was a, he was one of my favorite guys uses coming off the bench. And I remember this home run because it was, I don't know, it was about 25 or 30 feet off the right field line. And, you know, like, and he, and he, he hit it. And I, and I remember another home run where he hit that I thought was a grand slam. The guy called it foul one time. Okay. That, was a, that was another date. But th yeah. this, this home run, I remember well. Well, it, it was a huge home run. And in the grand scheme of things, you know, it, it helps you win a game. And when you come back and win a game after your starting pitcher lets up nine innings in, in or nine runs in one inning, uh, and you come back and win a game like that, I mean, that just says something about your team. And I think probably helps your team, you know, maybe refocus a little bit and say, all right, you know what? First of all, we're never out of any game. And, and second of all, come on, let's go. We're talented enough that uh, we shouldn't be in these six out of seven kind of losing streaks. Um, right. Again, and, and, and in this game, you know, Hamels gets lifted after three and two thirds. You use six additional pitchers out of your bullpen. And again, they each, each yeah. one of them gets the job done. That's how you go about winning uh, baseball games, but that's how you right. go about winning championships too. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, Greg, I, I mean, I couldn't say it no better. That's exactly what happens, you know, like, uh, actually it's unreal i you know some when i think of these uh, our, our teams you know like and uh the fact that you call me uh each week and things like that and we go over games that really i, I it registers better for me and uh if, if you go back and you sit down and all the game baseball you've seen and i never ever said anything about this to nobody uh we were cocky in, yeah. in our own way <laughs> You know, like we were very cocky uh, and in our own way. And I don't think that people really knew, you know, you know, knew how we uh, wanted to get it done. And I, th I think, and also too, all the years I've been in baseball, the teams that have managed, they're here for about four or five years, especially the ones where, where we were winning, you know, like they were closer to the fans than, than the fans will probably ever realize. And, and, the, and the fans helped make them that way. I mean, they liked our talent. They liked their personalities. They liked their character and things like that. So, therefore, you know, like, uh, to me, they play a part in that cockiness I used to see in our players. Cocky, cocky, <laughs> and confident. And then right. you need that in 162-plus in exactly. games. You need that in baseball. Well, you certainly have yeah. the swagger going on this Saturday yeah. afternoon. You win this game 10-9 to yeah. nine in front of 45,000-plus, as you mentioned, and the team goes on to win five in a row and regain first place in the NLE. So it was a turning point in the season. We're just about to head into August, and all of a sudden you're back on top of the division. And, well, we know how it ends, but we're not yeah. done 
not done reliving the journey, and we're going to do that uh, as the uh, the weeks go on here this summer in 2021. Charlie, always great to talk to you. Always great to reminisce about these games. You can't help but smile and get goosebumps when you talk about <laughs> some of these games and uh, and remembering what a magical summer it was in 2008. So good to good to see you, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks a lot. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Love Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.